has fallen when fear is calling still you're calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted you will be my strength when my mind
seated let me also say welcome back take two <laughs> like we started back one week and then then they kind of got that we went outside church left the building for like a month and a half now that was fun that was it was great outside we are blessed to live in San Diego 
we received texts and, and emails from people in other states who are watching and, and people like in Arizona and they said it's like 116 degrees and, and I just told them God likes some people more than other people. <laughs> Sorry. No, you know, no. God, God loves people in Arizona. He just wonders why they're there in the summer. But it, we had a great time outside and I want to thank our band and our team. They, they were amazing. All the people who helped make our outside event, concert, service. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm also glad today, when it feels like Arizona here, that we're inside. Uh, how many are, thank God for air conditioning. That's why, like I people say, you don't need buildings. Like, yeah, we do. So it's like, yeah, I'm glad we have, I'm glad we can, we, see the church is more than a building. So we can meet inside or outside, but we are the family of faith. And I'm so glad to see you. And this is the first weekend of September, hard to believe. And the first weekend of each month, we share communion together. And I want to invite those who are watching online as well, because we have people that are here, and, and it's so good to see your half mask faces. Now, you can take your mask down while we share communion. And online, uh, you can get your communion uh, elements together and ready. And the beautiful thing about being online, you can just hit pause until you have it all ready, and then, then take it off. And, and together as God's family, we share communion together, and, and the Bible doesn't tell us how often to do it. It just says as often as you do it. It's about remembering the right things and forgetting the wrong things, and we tend to do the opposite. And Paul says it was the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, and so if, if you would take the bread, and you'll find communion in the seat caddy right in front of you. If you didn't get it yet, there are two tabs. You do not have to be a member of Bonita Valley to be part of this communion time. And you don't have to be perfect because nobody is. It's communion that gives us what we need to be perfected. It's not a badge. And Jesus took the bread and when he blessed it, he broke it. Would you break the bread with me? He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. What are we remembering? Remembering the words of Isaiah that by his stripes we are made whole. He was broken in all the places and ways that we are broken. So that in all those places we can be put back together and made more than whole, be made absolutely complete in God. Paul says our completeness is in Christ. We want to pray. We want to pray for, for against this COVID virus. And, and again, uh, all the social distancing and masks and washing your hands, those, those are all very important things. But let me tell you where the answer comes from. It doesn't come from what we do. It comes from what God has done for us. And the answer for us, once again, in everything that we face is we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, who loved us through Jesus, loving us to the uttermost with all that he had. And so he suffered for us that we might be made whole and complete physically, emotionally, financially, relationally. There's no area that you're hurting that he didn't hurt that you might be healed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this bread. Thank you so much. We hold in our hands a receipt. You not only understand our wounds, our hurts, our pains, but you were wounded in pain and hurt for us so that by the price you paid, we could be absolutely whole, absolutely complete. I pray for miracles in this house. I pray for miracles as we eat this bread, not because this bread is magical or mystical. It just reminds us to trust you, to trust the one who's already provided everything that is needed. And now we receive it. We receive what your word calls the gift of healing. In Jesus' name. Let's eat the bread together. Thank you, Lord. And as freely as we receive this bread, we freely receive every gifting, every, every ability God has for us for every need of our life. And the second tab you come to, you pull back, it's the grape juice. Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me. The cup represents once again his shed blood for us. He not only paid for our brokenness, he paid for what separates us from God, and that is sin. In fact, the Bible says Jesus was made to be sin on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that our sin would never separate us from God. And nothing you've done, past, present, or future, he hasn't paid for in full, including me as well. God's plan is never that we live in guilt or shame. God never says shame on you. God says shame off of you. 
and he bore our shame and he bore our guilt that you and I might have freedom in God's presence, freedom to live. Father, thank you once again. Thank you for the freedom that comes through the price Jesus paid. And we thank you that he paid the ultimate price that we might experience an ultimate life. Thank you for grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for cleansing. And I pray that each one of us might know the freedom, the freedom that comes from knowing that there is no condemnation to those who are in, in Christ Jesus. For he was condemned that we might not have to be, that we might live life to the top. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's drink the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Our I Am Untitled Youth Ministry invites all junior high and high school students to a special in-person youth event this Thursday evening. This event will begin outside on the church lawn as we will welcome our brand new incoming 7th grade students. There will be lots of games and prizes, free pizza and soda, special guest Miss Davida, and a special message for our students by Pastor Jordan. It all happens this Thursday, September 10th from 6.30pm to 8pm. This Thursday, September 10th, our ministries to men and women launch a new season with a new series. The ladies begin an in-depth and eye-opening seven-session Bible study by Jackie Hill Perry, focused on the New Testament book of Jude. The men's Bible study, entitled 33, focuses on understanding your past and how it impacts and shapes your present and future. Both studies begin Thursday, September 10th at 6.30 p.m., with our ministry to men meeting in the Family Center and our ministry to women meeting in the Life Center gym. Collage invites all young adults and college students to our next event happening Friday, September 25th at 7 p.m. in the Family Center. There will be free food, live music, authentic community, and a special message by Pastor Jordan. To stay up on all things Collage, follow us on Instagram. If you've lost a spouse, child, family member, or friend, it's not always easy to find people who understand the deep hurt that you feel. At Grief Share, you'll meet people who are walking that painful path with you. During this 13-week course, you'll find yourself in a safe place of comfort and encouragement as you discover strategies that will help you hold on as you heal. For more information or to register for the group, go to VanitaValley.com, click on the Events tab, then select Grief Share. Because of the holiday, our Zumba, volleyball, and prayer night groups will be on break this Monday, September 7th, and we'll resume Monday, September 14th. The COVID-19 quarantine may have changed some things we do, but it hasn't changed who we are. Bonita Valley is still a connected community, even if we're doing it from distance by phone, on Zoom, or from behind a mask. We're still a caring community, helping and encouraging each other in creative new ways. And we're still a generous community. Your financial faithfulness continues to make ministry happen, even in these uncertain times. We couldn't do it without you. Remember, you can give online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 77977, or by mailing your gift to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. We are in a series simply titled Playlists. And I told you in part one uh, that I have several playlists on my smartphone. Uh, I have a playlist for running because it's like it doesn't work to run to slow you know, Kenny G music doesn't work to run. You, you need something like earth, wind, and fire. Like that's a, that's a spiritual group. Anyway, so I, I run to up music. I've got upbeat Christian music in, in, in earth, wind, and fire. In fact, I was running this week to, to, to Michael McDonald when he was talking about run. And so anyway, so, so running music, uh, working out music, you need something that kind of energizes you. When I write, as I was telling you, I use uh, Bethel music has just some awe instrumental that's just Really, really great. Uh, I'll sometimes listen to the piano boys, just piano and strings. And, and I need things without words because I, with words I start singing along. So, so I just need music. And, and so I have different playlists. I have spiritual songs, Christian songs, fun songs. So I get all kinds of things because different activities are encouraged with different playlists. 
And the same thing is true for us spiritually. The Psalms are songs. They're the songbook of Israel. They're their songbook for you and me. They've been preserved for us because they are songs that are about every experience and emotion of life. And as I told you in part one, let me just repeat again, the Psalms are unique in Scripture in that most of Scripture is God speaking to us, but the Psalms are people speaking to God. That's why they're so relatable. Like, I want to say that. I have said that. And, and they are expressing our emotions, our experiences, our, our situations to God. And they are incredible for us in their insights, their help, their encouragement, including this weekend. i got a special word for you. And let me set it up with a question. And he, here's, here's the question. How many of you, especially during this, this COVID you know, time and, and shutdown, how many of you have ever called a business or a restaurant and the first thing you heard was, can you hold, please? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. On occasion, not every time, but I have tried. On occasion, I'll say no, just to see if it matters. It doesn't. <laughs> like, it's not a question. Like, they're, they're basically telling you you're going on hold. You can say no all you want, but it's not an option. Okay? <laughs> they're sticking you on hold. My, my second question have you ever called heaven about a situation, a crisis, a need, a hope, a dream, a plan, and heard, can you hold, please? Or at least you were put on hold. You might have said no, but it didn't matter. You were on hold. And not just for a few moments, not just for a few hours, not just for a few days or weeks, but for months and, and for years. Like I called the airline when I was trying to fly back to Michigan, and they put me on hold for, I think it was an hour and 35 minutes. And I just let my phone play. I had to recharge my phone while I'm on hold. Have you ever felt that way with heaven? David did. In fact, that was David's experience. He was put on hold, not for minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, year, years he was put on hold. He was put on hold for years, and he actually wrote a song about it. David was a songwriter. And he wrote a song about when his life was on hold. But the song wasn't just for him. In fact, it's, it's Psalm 13 is the psalm that he writes about his life being on hold. But his song was also for others. It was for his nation. In fact, here, here's what, in my Bible, Psalm 13, not every psalm has directions under the, the number, but Psalm 13 does, and it's very significant. Here, here's what it says. For the director of music, a psalm of David. Now, I don't tell you that that's inspired, inspired writing, but I will tell you that it's, it's significant. It's significant for this reason. It tells us this psalm was not just David's personal song. David wanted it on the playlist of his nation. He said, I want, I want you to teach this song, director of music, to our whole country. And here's why. Because David knew that being on hold is not an option in life. It's a fact of life. See, you can tell God all you want. No, I don't want to be on hold. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're going to spend some time on hold. And for those of you in this place, and you go, I've never been on hold. Hang in there. You will be. Everybody experiences on hold times for your plans, your dreams, your hopes, your life. But not everybody does well during those on hold times. And in fact, David writes this song to show us how not only to survive being put on hold, but how to thrive, how to grow, how to develop, how to move forward. And, and, he, and he shares an incredible psalm. Now, it's a short psalm, and, and, and that ought to scare you because short psalms mean long sermons. No, I'm going to give you, I'm going to keep it tight. But he gives us three lessons about when your hopes and dreams are put on hold. And I want us to walk through them just for a moment because this psalm, this song needs to be on our playlist. You need this psalm in your life. I do. Here, here's the first lesson David shares. And if you want to write it down on our phones, there's like blanks and you can fill them in for those who like to fill things in. Here's the first lesson number one. When your hopes and dreams are on hold, vent up. Vent. I mean, you know what venting means? Yeah. David vents. In the first two verses, four times he says, how long? Let me show you. 
Psalm 13, verse 1, how long, Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face? How long must I wrestle? How long will my enemy triumph? We'll get to those details in a moment. I just want to highlight that four times David says, how long will I be on hold? He is venting. Now, let me just give you some context again, because you're like, come on, David. Let me tell you why he's so... Why, 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 why he's, he, he's struggling because David was on hold for maybe 15 years. See, Samuel, the prophet, had anointed him to be Israel's second king because of Saul's rebellion and failure. But, but from the time he was anointed to be king until he actually sat on the throne was almost 15 years, maybe more. But during those 15 years, not only was he, he, he waiting on hold, that's a long time to be on hold, and it wasn't for his dreams, it was God's dream for him. It wasn't his plans, it was God's plan for him. So it wasn't like he made it up, it was what God wanted, God told him, but yet it wasn't happening. And for as many as maybe eight of those 15 years, he lived on the run. He was running for his life. See, Saul wasn't that excited about being replaced. So he decided he would kill his successor before he could succeed him. And, and so he wanted to kill David, and, and he has armies chasing David. And, and during one of these times, David is, is just hiding out in some caves near Barstow. Okay, well, it wasn't Barstow, but it looked a lot like Barstow. And if you are from Barstow, <laughs> it's a good place to be from. No, 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 I'm not picking on you. It's, it, Barstow, Barstow's on the way to Vegas. And it used to have a Dairy Queen. I stopped there. I think that Dairy Queen is gone, so I don't stop in bars. But so it's like it's a godforsaken kind of place. And he's in a cave. So so just think with me. Think Barstow with no cell phone signal, no internet, no open restaurant. Kind of like Barstow during the pandemic. Okay, how would you do in Barstow during the pandemic? And so David has finally had it in events. Now listen carefully, something very important to understand about what David does. Venting, venting is not all bad. Because some people are like, well, it's, it's really bad to vent. No, in fact, I want to suggest to you that both biblically and, and psychologically that venting can be very good. As long as we vent in the right direction. That's why I had you write vent up. His name is Tremper Longman, and he writes the following, groaning or venting can be an act of intimacy, an opportunity to speak directly to God, not behind his back. Psalms of lament, psalms expressing pain, confusion, and struggles are an example of this. Psalm 13 is a psalm of lament, of venting. They give us permission to complain to God and invite us to speak to him with utter honesty. Grumbling, on the other hand, is complaining about God behind his back, as if that were possible. The Israelites grumbled in the wilderness. The psalm is groaned, vented in the presence of God. See, venting is not all bad by a long shot if you vent in the right direction. To vent behind God's back, which you really can't because God sees and hears everything, is to talk about God to others, but to vent to God and, and let me tell you why it's so important and why actually it's a good thing. And why there are so many psalms of venting, psalms of lament. Why? Because listen, first of all, venting to God is safe. What I mean by that is God can handle anything we think and anything we say. He really can. Now there are people that you have to like, how do I say this? You never have to do that with God. You never have to kind of figure out, okay, how do I phrase this so they don't misunderstand me, they don't like me anymore, they write me up. You can never say anything that's going to make God think anything differently than he thinks of you right now and loves you right now. I remember the story of a man who tragically lost his son in this accident. His young son was, was killed, and, and he was so angry and so broken and so hurt. He just drove for hours and just vented to God. In fact, let me just say what he said, and, and I don't say it to be crude. He said, I just vomited every emotion and thought. And when he was finally exhausted, he said, I heard God say, I can handle anything you say. I can handle anything you think. See, God is safe to vent. Not everyone is safe to vent to because they can't do anything about it and they'll, they'll, they'll think different, but God is safe to vent to. He's not going to tell anyone. 
And he can handle anything you feel, anything you say. But let me go beyond that. Here's why venting is so, it's not only safe, venting helps to clarify, it helps to clarify our thoughts. Not for God, he already understands them, for us. Psychologically, spiritually, when you speak things, when you vent them, you begin to, to get a handle on them that you don't have when you just feel them or think them. All right, let me, let me see if you've ever had this experience. Have you ever had thoughts or feelings and they felt right, it felt logical, it felt until you said it? Come on, have you ever had something going on in your head and then you spoke it and then you said it out loud? Well, that doesn't make sense. It did when you felt it. It did when you thought it. It just didn't when you said it. Now, he, 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 this, this, is why, this is why venting is important. Venting slows down our thoughts. It slows down our feelings, because sometimes our head is spinning, our feelings are spinning, and by the time you have to say it, to say it, you've got to slow it down. And once you speak it, like I'm a visual learner, now it be, it's actually my feelings and thoughts become visual in my words. And now I start understanding. It's exactly what David is doing. He's got all these emotions going. He's got anger. He's got, he's got all these things taking place, and he starts to vent them. And as he vents them, he starts to clarify, not for God, because God already knew. He knew the what and the why, but David didn't. And sometimes we don't. So let's walk walk through what he vented just for a moment. Let me show you what's going on in him and see if you can identify with it. David was feeling spiritually forgotten. Ever felt forgotten by God? Verse 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Ever felt like God put you on hold and then forgot you were there? How many of you have ever been to a restaurant and the, the person takes your order and then they go on vacation? Secondly, he felt forsaken. Verse 1, how long will you hide your face? See, he's going beyond feeling forgotten to forsaken. Okay, here's the difference. Now, don't raise your hands. First service didn't do real well at this, but I'll try you. How many of you parents, you have kids, you love them? But you have forgotten them. <laughs> There's been times where, like, didn't we have three? Didn't we have two? Didn't, didn't, I, didn't I have? It's like you left them somewhere. Now that was like unintentional. It's supposed to be unintentional. There's a difference between I forgot my kid and I'm hiding from my kid. I'm intentionally I'm playing hide and seek, or I'm hiding from them. And David felt like God didn't just forget him. God was intentionally hiding himself. It's happened to me. It happened to me, not with God. It happened to me with Rubio's. Yeah, lately. Some of you know I was sharing this a while back, but, but I, I went to Costco to get gas, and there's a Rubio's right by Costco, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the most of my time. I'm going to get gas, order food, do it all in the same spot. It was, it, was, it was a good plan. But how many of you know when you go to Costco to get gas, you better have gas? Because <laughs> you're going you're to be there for a while, unless you've got friends to push you to the pump. So I, I go to Costco to get gas, and, and Rubio's is just right by there, so I call Rubio's to place an order. So I'm, uh, man, I'm going to be efficient. And I call, and the first, will you hold, please? <laughs> sure, I'm going to get gas. So I, I hold, and I'll have my phone, the music's playing. I finally get up to gas. I put the gas mic, it's still playing. I got my phone outside. I'm still listening to my phone. I finally get my gas. Like, this is taking a long time. I get out of the gas area. I, it's still playing. I drive across the street. I'm thinking, Rubio's must be packed. I mean, I've been on hold for like a long time. I get across the road, and the parking lot's pretty empty. I'm like, well, that's cool. And I walk in expecting, okay, there's a line. There was nobody in line. Nobody. No one, except one guy behind the counter. And I step up and I see a phone on the counter. And it's blinking. And I'm holding my phone. True story. I said to the guy, that's me. <laughs> like, like, I thought other things beyond that, but I stopped there. Like, like, I don't say everything I think, so I just... <laughs> That's, oh, have you ever felt like saying to God, see that blinking phone? That's me. Answer it. Like, this is not like you forgot me. It's blinking right in front of you. You're choosing to ignore me. And then David felt frustrated. See, he felt forgotten and then forsaken, but, but he speaks of, of his frustration. But, but when he vents it, come on, many of us have felt frustrated. But why am I frustrated? And when I slow down my feeling and my thinking and I begin to say it to God, I begin to clarify. 
Let me show you what David says. He clarifies his frustration in a really insightful verse, verse 2. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Now, these, these three things were reasons for his frustration and ours. Because sometimes you can't solve a problem until you understand it. You can't really work through something until you know what you're working on. The, the phrase, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts, is a, is a Hebrew idiom that, that means how long do I have to, one translation is take counsel with my soul. It means counsel myself. How long do I have to fix this on my own? Like, God, if you're not going to help me, i got to fix it myself. i got to be my own fixer. And it wasn't working out so well for David. Now, don't raise your hand in this room if you're a fixer, but we know who we are. In fact, my wife, and this is not a marriage seminar, but I'll, I'll throw this in. My wife, on occasion, will say to me, well, actually, she will preface what she's going to say to me by saying, I'm going to tell you something, but don't fix it. I'm like, hold on. See, like, problems for me aren't entertainment. If you don't fix them, why tell me? It's like, I don't get entertained by problems, but, 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 but she's saying, just, just care about my problem. No, I want to fix the problem. That's what fixers do. And I know that, that that's a guy thing. No, men and women are both fixers. Women just fix things in nicer ways. But we're all fixers. And David was basically saying, I'm frustrated because have any of you figured out you can't fix your life? And there are situations that are beyond your ability to fix them. How long must I try to fix this on my own? And then he identifies another reason for frustration when he says this. He says that there's a dailiness. Every day have sorrow in my heart. One of the things that really got to David, it gets to me as well, it's not just having problems, it's problems that don't go away. Now, I don't do nearly as much counseling as I have done in the past because of the size of ministry and everything else, but, but I don't mind counseling as long as people get better. But when you see someone and they never get better, or you have a problem that never gets, it's not having a problem, it's having problems that won't go away. And when you have the same problem again and again and again, not only with others, but in our own life and the dailiness of his situation. And then he says something uh, uh, that's so, well, it's so much like, like me, maybe it's like you. And David asked God, how long will my enemy triumph over me? Let me paraphrase it. God, how long will the wrong people keep winning? Now, in David's case, King Saul was the wrong guy. He rebelled. He, he, so many, and he's living in a palace. And David is God's anointed living in a cave in Barstow, outside of Barstow, like Barstow. He's like, come on, God, why do the wrong people keep, I'll tell you when, I'll tell you when most people ask that question on November 4th. But, but I tell you, <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but why do the wrong people keep winning? And God has answers, but I can't, I can't tell you, I'll tell you later. But we wonder, the in, it's injustice. David just can't take the injustice of what's happening in the world. Now, I walk you through these things one more time, and and. And I encourage you to understand that what David is do, doing is he is venting up. And he's teaching his nation to when you think you can't take it, vent up. It's important. Don't just eat it. Don't just swallow it. It'll kill you. Vent it in God's direction. God can handle it. It is safe. And it will give you clarity. It'll help you to start to have a handle on what's going on. And you'll start to understand what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And at least you now know what you're doing. It's not this ethereal feeling. You've now made it concrete. Now, that's the first lesson. Here's the second. In your notes, the second lesson is this. When your hopes and dreams are on hold, ask God for help. We're going to write or think about, ask God. Some of you go, duh. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, we expect a pastor to tell us to pray. And David does exactly this eventually. I tell you eventually because, it, and, and I've done a whole series on David. I, I love his life and his story. And there's a time when David's on the run. And, and early on, David prays a lot. But there's a time in which he's finally so tired of all this stuff going on that David just thinks, Saul's going to get me, Saul's going to kill me. And he takes off and goes to the enemy's territory. And here's what you'll read. David does not pray. He just runs. It's amazing how many times you and I just run, but we don't pray. We know God is a helper. We don't ask him for help. 
And so David is saying, sooner rather than later, once you vent it, once you have a handle on what's really going on, then turn your venting into praying and begin to pray. And David prays in two special ways that I encourage you and me to pray. And I want you to write them down. There's two special ways that David prays. Again, Psalm 13, verse 3, look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice. Two things David prays. So important. Here's the first one in your notes. David prays in the dark. And so should we. Here's what I mean. Externally, nothing has changed for David. He moves from venting to praying. Nothing has changed on the outside, but as he prays, something starts to change on the inside. And it's 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 right in these verses. It 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 can be easily it's found in what's called a possessive pronoun. And I it's why I encourage you to read scripture slowly. David doesn't just say, Lord, help me. He says, Oh Lord, my God. See, in his venting, he just said, Lord, 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 Lord. But in his prayer, he calls him my God. David starts to pray in faith. He starts to pray in relationship. He starts to pray in what, 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 what I'll call flying by the instruments. Now, we have some pilots in our church, but most of us aren't pilots. But, but there are small planes in pilots, and I've been in small planes, and I don't plan to go on another one, but I've been in small planes. And, and, and you have to fly by seeing landmarks, and, and, and they, fly, they fly by seeing things. If you can't see things, you don't know where you are. And then there's flying by the instruments, which is another level of flying, another level of training, in which you fly by, by instruments, and it takes both training and trust, and so does, so does praying. Praying involves training and trust. Because all of a sudden, David, he, he can't see anymore. And I was reading about how certain trainers teach student pilots to fly by the instruments, and they put blinders on them. Kind of like on horses, they put blinders so they can't see things around them. The only thing they can see are the instruments. And they are taught, ignore the butt of your stomach, ignore your senses, ignore, because those things can be very misleading. And all of us have experienced that. When I was a kid, we played stupid games. I don't know if any of you play stupid games. One of the stupid games was you put your head on a bat and you spin around in circles. Now, the reason that's stupid is, first of all, I don't hand, handle spinning things very well. I don't go on any spinning rides. I don't, it, it's, it's a weight loss program, but I don't go on those, <laughs> those things because you lose what, anyway. So, so you spin and you spin and you spin, and then you can't walk straight because you're disoriented. And there are many things in life that disorient us. And you can't trust how you're feeling. It feels like it should be that way. It feels like up is down and down is up. And you learn this instrument, it doesn't feel right. But it's not about my feelings. If the instruments are trustworthy, trust the instruments. God is trustworthy. Trust an unfailing God more than our disoriented feelings. It's what Job learns to do in his spiritual flight training. He learns to fly by the instruments. Job has this amazing life with God, but God takes him to the next level. He has all these visible signs of blessing, and then God allows Satan to take all those things away, including a sense of God's presence. And watch what happens. It's in Job. He writes this, Job 23, verse 8. If I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Job was learning to fly by the instrument, not of his feelings, not of his sight. But I know that he knows where I am. I'm going to trust in God's faithfulness more than I'm going to trust in my feelings. And that's what David was learning. That's what you and I have to learn. We have to learn that our feelings can sometimes, like, do I always feel like God is listening to me? Do I always feel like God hears my prayers? It was a, it was a, a number of months ago, and, and a guy in the back after a service asked me, he says, Pastor, do you always feel God's presence? And I could tell he thought, like, as a man of God, and, and, and you know, and, and, and so I said, no. And I could see, like, you don't? I'm like, no. I don't always feel God's presence, but I, I know he's with me. When I walk through the valley of the shadows, I don't see God, but I... See, I, 
I want to fly by the fact that God says he can never lie. And when he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he won't. And so I pray in the dark. This is what David is. He prays in the dark. He learns to seek God no matter what he senses or feels. But then the second thing he does is he prays for light. This prayer that he prays, God, answer me and, 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 and enlighten my eyes. He prays for light. It's actually a twofold request. He's praying for perspective. Give light to my eyes means I want to see clearly because I'm not seeing things clearly. See, David's perspective was God has forsaken me, he's ignoring me, he's frustrating me. And those were true feelings, but they weren't based on truth. <laughs> you can have true feelings. You're feeling it, but my feelings aren't based on truth. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what I, what I need when my feelings and emotions or thoughts are all over the place is I need truth to anchor to. And where does that come from? It comes from God. And so I pray, God, David felt forsaken. God says, I will never forsake you. I'll never leave you. One of the most tender verses in all of Scripture. It's just an amazing verse in Isaiah. Because people often, the Israelites, God, you forgot us. You forgot us. And God says, listen, let me tell you, I will never forget you. Can a mother nursing her baby forget her baby? He said, God says, no, but even if that were possible, I will not forget you. I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. That God doesn't have real hands, but he's saying, I've, engra I've engraved you on me. It is impossible for me to forget. If you feel forgotten, it's just your feelings. It, God didn't forget you. He can't forget you. He can't abandon you. He can't drop you. He will not frustrate you. He will grow you. He will never test you. He will never tempt you to sin. He will test you to grow. Those are two very different things. So David prays for insight. For many of us, the biggest problem we face is not our problem, it's how we view problems. It's the worst thing that could happen to me. It's not what God says. James gives us this truth, this, this insight. We, we looked at it before, real quick. James 1 verse 2, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, problems of many kinds, you go, yeah, right. Because you know, here's the perspective, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's really a positioning term. It means to abide under God. And let abiding under God, persevering, finish its work so you may be mature and complete. See, nobody grows up in one step. Not lacking anything. If you lack wisdom, we all do. You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given. Within the context of this passage, God is saying, when you don't understand what's going on in your life, the problems you're going through, ask me for wisdom. And I will show you the process that I'm working in your life. It may have come from the evil, it may come from, but God works all things together for good. And when problems happen, it makes me get under God. And when I get under God, I grow up when I stay under God. And then I become mature and I don't lack anything. So instead of cursing problems, we need God's perspective of problems. And that's what David was praying for. But he not only prayed for insight, he prayed secondly for inspiration. We need to pray for divine strength. Give light to my eyes was a Hebrew phrase, an idiom that not only meant enlightenment, it meant to be inspired, it meant to be strengthened, it meant to be energized. David said, I not only want to see what I need to see, I want the strength to do what I need to do. All right, let me try to help you with that. How many of you have ever had times in your life in which you knew what you should do, you just didn't want to do it? <laughs> you are a holy group, okay? Like, you are, like, way over my level. Honestly, there are times, my struggle is not knowing what to do. My struggle is wanting to do what I know I should do. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to have to park here because you're just not, okay, how many of you know that you should exercise, <laughs> but you don't do it? I mean, no, I, I should eat better. You, you know what to do, I just don't do it. We, there's all kinds of things we know to do. So, so, so David prays for the want to. And that's a very biblical prayer. Watch this. I, I love this verse, and I actually quote it a lot in my own life. It's found in Philippians 2, verse 13. Paul writes, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. Here's one of the meanings. That God not only works in you to show you his will, he works in you to, to help your will. God works in you to will and to act. There are times, I'll be honest, that I say, God, help me want to. <laughs> I know what you want, I just don't want to do it. And so I not only pray for inspiration, 
insight. I pray for the energy and the strength to do what God has called me to do, to be who God has called me to be. So David moves from venting, being real with God, slowing down his thoughts and feelings and sharing them with God, getting clarity, to praying, to praying, my God, I don't, nothing's changed, nothing's different, but something was different in David when he begins to reach out in faith, I can't see you yet, God, but you see me, I can't hear you yet, God, but you hear me, and I need to see, and I need strength. And then one more, last lesson, lesson number three. When your hopes and dreams are on hold, sing praises. <laughs> I want you to write the word sing. Now, some of you, like, you're not writing, you got your phones, so I want you to say it out loud. Say it out loud, sing. Here we go. Okay, just so it gets in your head. Let me show you out of, out of Psalm 13, verse 5. But, he turns the corner, but, I make a choice. But I trust in your unfailing love. See, it's not, I don't trust my unfailing feelings. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation, your wholeness. Verse 6, I will, say it, sing the Lord's what? praise. For he has been, say it out loud, good to me. Now I tell you, and listen, Pastor Mike shared a great two-part series, or two-part on, on, on Psalm, and, and, and his Tommy talked about David, about speaking praise. And there are times Scripture tells us, speak praise, say praise. But this is a direct command to sing praise to the director of music. This is your I want Israel to sing this song. Now, why? Why does he say sing? Well, listen, singing does something speaking doesn't do. Singing does something thinking doesn't do. Singing does something in our lives, and I found it incredibly interesting. You want to do a great read? Go on Google, because as long as you have Google, you're smart. So Google the science of singing. Google the benefits of singing. You'll discover that scientists are discovering all kinds of things that happen positively when we sing. Okay, let me, I'll just give you a few real quick. I'll put them on the screens. Here's one. Researchers have found singing can lower cholesterol and relieve stress and tension. Studies show that when people sing, endorphins, oxytocin, are released by the brain, which lowers stress and anxiety levels. They've measured what happens when you sing, and it actually relieves stress and tension. Here's a second. Singing can strengthen the immune system. Immediately after singing, researchers found that singers have a higher level of antibody that's essential to a healthy immune system. You produce healthy... Singing is COVID fighting. <clears throat> hey, wear a mask, wash your hands, build your immune system. <laughs> Another message. Singing can improve memory and slow down dementia. British researchers report that singing improves aspects of memory, sociability, and mood in seniors. And while there's no proof that singing can prevent dementia, it has been shown to delay the onset of some age-related cognitive problems. It was a study called Sing and Change Your Brain. It was just an amazing study. It, it, it can't reverse it, but it can slow things down. And I, I, didn't put it, I didn't put it on the screen, but one more that I found incredibly interesting was all of these benefits happen even if you're a lousy singer. <laughs> like you go, I'm no good. It didn't matter. They got people together and had them singing in a group, and they were all horrible. It's like going to your, your elementary kid's band concert. Now, I know it's, it's music in somebody's ears, but, but, but they're playing. Maybe that's why Psalm 98 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. It's like, like it's music in God's ears. But when you sing, it does something in you physically, health-wise, your antibodies. But that's the science part of singing. Let me give you the scriptural part. Those are scientific benefits. Let me just give you two scriptural ones and, and we're done, okay? And listen, just hang loose because it's air conditioned in here, okay? It's like 100 degrees outside, feels like Arizona. So let me give you just, just two, two quick biblical Benefits, spiritual benefits. Here's the first in your notes. Singing praises to God is life refocusing. Verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. David starts to sing, and his focus changes from what isn't working in his life to the God who is. He talks about you have been good to me. Listen, life isn't good, but God is good. 
And God works all things together for good. And David's focus begins to change. He's not denying reality. He's just acknowledging a greater reality. And focus is one of the most important aspects of our life because here's, here's the bottom line. Where you look, you go. Jordan and I, a couple years back, we went and took some motorcycle classes and, and riding things. Like I, I started riding motorcycles when I was just a kid, but, but we went to, to get our motorcycle license and I'll never forget the instructor kept drilling something at us over and over and over again because he had to drive around stuff and pylons. And, and, his, and, and he says, don't look at the pylon, don't look at the ground, look at, look at the end because here was his line again and again, where you look, you go. And he said, if you look down, you're going down. If you look where you want to go, that's where you go. It's amazing. Scripture says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and completer of our faith. What, where you fix your eyes is where you go. Jesus said in the end times, a lot of bad things are going to happen. Things are going to fall apart. You're going to think the world's coming to an end. And, and Jesus says it is. And then he says, look up for your salvation. It's close. Interesting. He says, look up. Don't, don't, don't look at, oh, no, look up. Where you look, you go. Praise changes where I look. When I begin to praise God, I begin to look up. I begin to look at who God is. I begin to rehearse who God is. When I sing his praises, I remind myself of the truth of God and his goodness. You have been good to me. But the second thing it does, it not only refocuses it, the second thing that, that, that singing praise does is secondly, singing praises to God is life releasing. It was for David. It was for Paul and Silas. Let me show you real quick. Acts 16, verse 25. Paul and Silas, quick context, are beaten, brutally beaten for, for preaching, thrown into prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were, watch this, praying and, say it out loud, singing, pray. Okay, we'll do that one more time with a little more enthusiasm, okay? Here, here we go. Right, context again. I'm, I promise I'm going to move fast. Context. You have been beaten up for doing something good. You're telling people about Jesus. And instead of being thanked, they beat you to within an inch of your life. They, they bloody your back. Then they put you in prison. They put shackles on you. They put you so you can't even move. And now it's midnight and you're still awake because you can't sleep. You are in pain. Now, how many of you would have began to sing praises? <laughs> Not a lot of us. But we should. And about midnight, they were praying and singing praises to God. While the other prisoners were listening, they didn't have any choice. Well, the, and suddenly a strong earthquake shook the jail to its foundation and the doors opened and the chains, what? Fell from all the prisoners. Praising God is releasing. It releases us sometimes physically, it always releases us spiritually. Now, some of my favorite preachers, honestly, are African-American preachers, black preachers, they just... T.D. Jakes, there's others, they're just, they, 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 wordsmith, they, they just amaze me. And, but I heard a, a, an African-American preacher preaching on this passage, and I'd never heard it before, and I'd never really thought it before, and it's not really there, but it was still amazing. And here's what, what he preached. He, he preached that, that God's in heaven, and he knows that Paul and Silas, his servants, have been thrown in jail. And, it's, and, and God's on his throne, and all of a sudden he hears singing. Yes, I like that. Here's music. I like that. He goes, well, where's that coming from? And he says, it's Paul and Silas. He goes, I thought they were in jail. Yeah, they're in jail. And they're singing. And he says, God, God enjoyed their song so much, he started to tap his toe. And when God taps his toe, it creates earthquakes. Like, I don't know if that's what happened. There's an earthquake because God, I don't know if God tapped his toe, but I know he loves praises. Because Scripture says he enthrones himself in praise. That where you praise God, God enthrones him. God creates ruling places when we praise him. If you want God to rule in the place you're in, praise him in the place you're in. Because he enthrones himself in praise. As the song says, the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you. They drop powerless behind you when you praise the Lord. So nothing changes outside, but David begins to praise, and it releases him. 
David knew what it was to live for years on hold, and so he wrote a song about it. An on hold song that he wanted the whole nation to learn because on hold times aren't optional in life. They are the fact of life. You will spend time on hold, your dreams, your plans, and for a lot of different reasons. But David says there's three things that I learned to do, and I, I want you to learn this song that when your hopes and dreams are on hold, vent up. Don't just swallow it. Don't talk about God to others. Talk to God. He can handle anything you say. It is safe. And when you talk about it to God, you'll help clarify it for yourself. And you'll start to get it out of the feeling, thinking, ethereal realm, and you start to make it concrete, and you begin to understand it. And after you vent it, pray about it. After you understand what's going on in my life, you then say, God, give light to my eyes. Pray in the dark. Pray in the dark for perception. Pray in the dark for insight. God, help me to see what you see. Pray for strength to do what God wants you to do. I don't just need insight. I need inspiration. I need, I need perception and I need power. So pray. Ask God. James says you don't have what you need because you don't ask God. So ask and ask sooner than later. And the third thing David says is when your life is on hold, your dreams, your plans, your hopes are on hold, sing praise. Just sing praises to God. You have been good to me. It'll change your focus from what isn't good to a God who always is. It'll change, it'll change your focus. It, it'll change and, and give you a strength and, and, and a freedom because when you praise God, it releases you to be and do what God has called you to be and do. So here's my challenge. You need Psalm 13 on your playlist. I need it to be part of the playlist of my life for those on hold times that we're all gonna experience, that we might survive them and thrive. Let's pray. God, I don't know who today, in this house or online, is just so tired of waiting. They have promises that they're holding on to. They have dreams for a child. They have dreams for a marriage. They have dreams for a job. They have dreams for an education. They have hopes and dreams for healing. They have dreams for, for their, their child to come back to you. They have dreams, Lord, and hopes, and, and many of them came from you but they're not happening. And Lord, some of the most discouraging moments of our life is when we just feel like we're going to be on hold forever. And I pray from David's song, you will teach us. You will teach us how to thrive. You will teach us how to act what we can do when it seems like there's nothing to do. And if you never accepted Jesus as the Savior of your life, I encourage you right where you are, right now, wherever that may be, to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of all the decisions I've made that have taken me in the wrong direction. And I accept your gift of forgiveness and grace and life. And I want to follow you. I want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. In Jesus' name.